to another episode of Project Supercar. And I think what we'll do is we'll go over the engine bay, and there's quite a lot to consider when you're designing your own supercar when it comes to the engine bay. Well, as you can see behind me, the tent's gone. I had a bit of a disaster with that, but enough of that. Let's have a look at the prototype. I think we need to talk about supercars in general, just for a moment. Supercars aren't surprisingly all about performance. Sure, it's an important part, but there's many other factors. The supercar is all about how it makes you feel. What's the driving position like? What's the look of the car? How does it handle the sound, the, the engine and all this? This all makes the supercar experience what it is. One of these areas is the engine and the engine configuration. Now, as you may know, if you've been following my channel, this currently has a V6 inline configuration. But not all supercars have this type of layout. There are many supercars that have a transverse layout. This is where the gearbox is at one side and the engine runs across the chassis. A few examples would be like the Lotus Avora, Honda NSX, and even the Lamborghini Miura. But there are many other cars that have a transverse engine, two seats, and it's in the back. Does that make it a supercar? Take the MR2, for example. That's just a few, and I'm sure you can think of some others. I'd love to hear your thoughts, so if you'd like to drop a comment, and we can all chat about it. Anyway, when I was designing my supercar, one of the things I wanted was an engine bay with great access. This is one of the reasons why the rear clamp opens up like that. And if you're wondering, yes, that does take a lot more work to build than just a one piece body shell. So let's take a closer look at my engine bay. Now one of the cars I've owned was a Lotus Esprit. That had a really tight engine bay. In fact, you couldn't get between the front of the engine and the bulkhead. And as Ed China always says, if you've got more than two jobs on the engine, you should pull it out. Isn't that right, Ed? And there is a rule of thumb with these Lotuses that if you've got more than two jobs to do on an engine, you really should take the engine out. Which, of course, at this stage, looking at all the bits I have to undo, is quite an epic challenge. Thanks, Ed. So what I really did want to do was design a car where you had to drop the entire engine gearbox out just to give it a service. A bit like a typical Ferrari. As you can see, there's an Audi V6 in there, but it could be any V6, say the 300ZX, that's another car I owned, where the engine bay was incredibly tight, 
But once you pull the engine out, it's a fantastic engine. I know everybody likes the Toyota 2J Z straight six, and there's no denying that's a fantastic engine, and you can get an easy 800 brake horsepower out of that thing. Well, a lot of people don't know is the 300ZX engine had forged internals, and you could get about the same amount of power to one of those as well. However, working on that engine in the car, the actual Nissan 300ZX, was tricky. Here's a quick video of how to pull the engine out. V6s are great, but I made this engine bay big enough so I could put a V8 in there and maybe even a straight six. Um, I might need some of you lot out there to give me some measurements. So if you've got some uh, measurements of a, I don't know, two JZ, uh, drop in the comments. But anyway, any engine could really fit in the back of this thing. I made the engine bay that big, maybe even a Bentley engine this engine needs to go. And a good piece of news about this engine is that I got another one. Check that out. So you ever seen a Bentley engine outside of its engine bay? It's actually pretty compact. This W12, it's no longer than like a six cylinder. Actually, it's no longer than, than a, I'd say a four cylinder. It's pretty short, just goes from here to here. I think it's like two feet. And it's it's really compact, it's really wide. Oh yeah, that's, that's gonna be easy to install. So this is a 2006 Bentley Continental Flying Spur engine, and it should be identical to the one in the Continental GT. So if you know any good combos, you know, um, engine plus gearbox, and any companies that have actually developed a mounting bracket plate, call it what you will, clutch assembly, um, leave a comment down below and I'll uh, check it out and maybe talk about it in uh, future videos. Now as I've mentioned before in other episodes, I have tried to design this car so it's modular, so other people can change it. So you don't have to put an inline engine, you could put a transverse engine. I don't know, maybe something like the Audi TT RS engine? Ryan Little. <laughs>
don't know if you can quite see that, but here, where my hand is, the idea is to have a removable panel. It'd be bolted in and there'd be soundproofing and fireproofing, that sort of thing. But you would undo it, pull it out, and then you can get to the engine. Take a quick look. It should make changing the timing belt a little bit easier. Let's measure the engine bay and the engine. It's 104 centimetres wide. And it's 136 centimetres long. Okay, let's measure the V6. centimeters long maybe a little shorter maybe 48 if anybody has the exact measurements drop in the comments let's take a look at the gearbox and the gearbox looks to be about 60 centimeters there's the space between the engine and the bulkhead Plenty of space. You can get a V8 in there, no problem. If you really do need more space, you could modify the rear chassis so the gearbox sticks out a little further. Say if you want to use a Porsche 911 gearbox or something like that. In fact, I might be redesigning the rear chassis anyway on the turbo chassis. Um, I might be putting a rear diffuser on the back of this thing and some other slight changes but we'll get into that in another episode. Let's take a look at the 2.7T, just see how long that is. Well surprise surprise it's about the same as the 2.8 normally aspirated, it's about 50 centimeters long. This will fit in that engine bay no problem. How about my daily driver, 3.2 V6? Let's take a look. This one looks even shorter than the 2.7. The plastics is uh, getting in the way a little bit and some of the hoses, but it looks like it's about 48 centimeters. So now I've got my engine size and gearbox size, and I know my wheelbase, and I know my driving position, that's how I managed to work out how big to make the engine bay. The 2.7T should easily fit in here with plenty of space for some big turbos and intercoolers. While I was researching the 2.7T, I found a couple of pictures which might interest you. Some chap, I don't know who, um, put a 2.7T Quattro system into an Audi TT. Looks pretty cool, interesting project. So now I've got my leg out, I can start building the chassis and we'll pop over to my garage and we'll just touch on what I did next. So now I've got my measurements, I know the size of the engine, gearbox, driving position and my wheelbase and I know how wide the engine bay is going to be, I can start piecing the chassis together. I originally used the donor car's rear shock absorber for mock-up purposes. Now because the suspension brackets on the chassis are considered critical, I decided not to try and make them by hand because I just don't have the equipment to do that. I had them cut out via water jet. Once my plates were delivered and I had all my steels cut to the right length, I tack welded everything together. Once everything was tacked together, I could then fully weld it up. But I had to stitch weld it, so what you would do is you go from one corner to another to another in a diagonal pattern, just doing small stitches at a time. If you try and weld up one corner completely, the heat will warp your chassis. So you've got to be careful, go back and forth, bit by bit, and eventually you'll have it all fully welded up. Once the chassis was all welded up, I thought it was time to get some custom coilovers made. 
And once they were done, the rear part of the chassis was pretty much done. But I think in the next episode, we'll have to cover the engine mounts and some engine bracing. So for now, I think that'll do. See you in the next one.